This is a recording of Things Fall Apart by Chinua Ochebe. Chapter 7 For three years, Ikemefuna lived in Okonkwo's household, and the elders of Umofia seemed to have forgotten about him. He grew rapidly like a yam tendril in the rainy season and was full of the sap of life. He had become wholly absorbed into his new family. He was like an elder brother to Nwoye, and from the very first seemed to have kindled a new fire in the younger boy. He made him feel grown up, and they no longer spent the evenings in mother's hut while she cooked, but now sat with Okonkwo in his obi, or watched him as he tapped his palm tree for the evening wine. Nothing pleased Nwoye now more than to be sent for by his mother or another of his father's wives to do one of those difficult and masculine tasks in the home, like splitting wood or pounding food. On receiving such as message through a younger brother or sister, Nwoye would feign annoyance and grumble aloud about women and their troubles. Okonkwo was inwardly pleased at his son's development, and he knew it was due to Ikemefuna. He wanted Nwoye to grow into a tough young man capable of ruling his father's household when he was dead and gone to join the ancestors. He wanted him to be a prosperous man, having enough in his barn to feed the ancestors with regular sacrifices. And so he was always happy when he heard him grumbling about women. That showed that in time he would be able to control his women folk. No matter how prosperous a man was, if he was unable to rule his women and his children, and especially his women, he was not really a man. He was like the man in the song who had ten and one wives and not enough soup for his Fufu. So Okonkwo encouraged the boys to sit with him in his obi, and he told them stories of the land, masculine stories of violence and bloodshed. Nwoye knew that it was right to be masculine and to be violent, but somehow he still preferred the stories that his mother used to tell, and which she no doubt still told to her younger children stories of the tortoise and his wily ways, and of the bird, Ine K N T Oba, who challenged the whole world to a wrestling contest and was finally thrown by the cat. He remembered the story she often told of the quarrel between earth and sky long ago, and how sky withheld rain for seven years until crops withered and the dead could not be buried, because the hose broke on the stony earth. At last, Vulture was sent to plead with Skye, and to soften his heart with a song of the suffering of the sons of men. Whenever Nwoye's mother sang this song, he felt carried away to the distant scene in the sky where Vulture, Earth's emissary, sang for mercy. At last, Sky was moved to pity, and he gave to Vulture rain wrapped in leaves of cocoa yam. But as he flew home, his long talon pierced the leaves, and the rain fell as it had never fallen before. And so heavily did it rain on Vulture that he did not return to deliver his message, but flew to a distant land from where he had espied a fire. And when he got there, he found it was a man making a sacrifice. He warmed himself in the fire and ate the entrails. That was the kind of story that Nwoye loved. But he now knew that they were for foolish women and children. And he knew that his father wanted him to be a man. And so he feigned that he no longer cared for women's stories. And when he did this, he saw that his father was pleased and no longer rebuked him or beat him. So Nwoye and Ikemefuna would listen to Okonkwo's stories about tribal wars, or how, years ago, he had stalked his victim, overpowered him, and obtained his first human head. 
And as he told them of the past, they sat in darkness or the dim glow of logs, waiting for the women to finish their cooking. When they finished, each brought her bowl of fufu and bowl of soup to her husband. An oil lamp was lit and Okonkwo tasted from each bowl and then passed two shares to Nawoye and Ikemefuna. In this way, the moons and the seasons passed and then the locusts came. It had not happened for many a long year. The elders said locusts came once in a generation reappeared every year for seven years, and then disappeared for another lifetime. They went back to their caves in a distant land where they were guarded by a race of stunted men. And then after another lifetime, these men opened the caves again, and the locusts came to Umofia. They came in the cold harmattan season after the harvest had been gathered and ate up all the wild grass in the fields. Okonkwo and the two boys were working on the red outer walls of the compound. This was one of the lighter tasks of the after harvest season. A new cover of thick palm branches and palm leaves was set on the walls to protect them from the rainy season. Next, Okonkwo worked on the outside of the wall and the boys worked from within. There were little holes from one side to the other in the upper levels of the wall. And through these, Okonkwo passed the rope, or tie-tie, to the boys, and they passed it around the wooden stays and then back to him. And in this way, the cover was strengthened on the wall. The women had gone to the bush to collect firewood, and the little children to visit their playmates in the neighboring compounds. The harmattan was in the air and seemed to distill a hazy feeling of sleep on the world. Okonkwo and the boys worked in complete silence, which was only broken when a new palm frond was lifted onto the wall, or when a busy hen moved dry leaves about in her ceaseless search for food. And then, quite suddenly, a shadow fell on the world, and the sun seemed hidden behind a thick cloud. Okonkwo looked up from his work and wondered if it was going to rain at such an unlikely time of the year. But almost immediately, a shout of joy broke out in all directions, and Umofia, which had dozed in the noonday haze, broke into life and activity. Locusts are descending! was joyfully chanted everywhere, and men, women, and children left their work or their play and ran into the open to see the unfamiliar sight. The locusts had not come for many, many years, and only the old people had seen them before. At first, a fairly small swarm came. They were the harbingers sent to survey the land and then appeared on the horizon a slowly moving mass like a boundless sheet of black cloud drifting towards Umofia. Soon it covered half the sky, and the solid mass was now broken by tiny eyes of light like shining stardust. It was a tremendous sight, full of power and beauty. Everyone was now about, talking excitedly and praying that the locusts should camp in Umofia for the night. For although locusts had not visited Umofia for many years, everybody knew by instinct that they were very good to eat. And at last, the locusts did descend. They settled on every tree and on every blade of grass. They settled on the roofs and covered the bare ground. Mighty tree branches broke away under them, and the whole country became the brown earth color of the vast, hungry swarm. Many people went out with baskets trying to catch them, but the elders counseled patience until nightfall, and they were right. The locusts settled in the bushes for the night, and their wings became wet with dew. Then all Umofia turned out in spite of the cold harmattan, and everyone filled his bags and pots with locusts. The next morning they were roasted in clay pots and then spread in the sun until they became dry and brittle. 
and for many days this rare food was eaten with solid palm oil. Okonkwo sent, sat in his obi, crunching happily with Ikemefuna and Nooye, and drinking palm wine copiously. When Ogboifi, Eze Udu, came in, Eze Udu was the oldest man in this quarter of Umofia. He had been a great and fearless warrior in his time, and was now accorded great respect in all the clan. He refused to join in the meal and asked Okonkwo to have a ward with him outside. And so they walked out together. The old man sporting himself with his stick, when they were out of earshot, he said to Okonkwo, That boy calls you father. Do not bear a hand in his death. Okonkwo was surprised and was about to say something when the old man continued. Yes, Umofia has decided to kill him. The oracle of the hills and the caves has pronounced it. They will take him outside Umofia, as is the custom, and kill him there. But I want you to have nothing to do with it. He calls you his father. The next day, a group of elders from all the nine villages of Umofia came to Okonkwo's house early in the morning and before they began to speak in low tones, Nooye and Ikemefuna were sent out. They did not stay very long, but when they went away, Okonkwo sat still for a very long time, supporting his chin in his palms. Later in the day, he called Ikemefuna and told him that he was to be taken home the next day. Nooye overheard it and burst into tears, whereupon his father beat him heavily. As for Ikemefuna, he was at a loss. His own home had gradually become very faint and distant. He still missed his mother and his sister and would be very glad to see them. But somehow he knew he was not going to see them. He remembered once when men had talked in low tones with his father, and it seemed now as if it was happening all over again. Later, Nawoye went to his mother's hut and told her that Ikemefuna was going home. She immediately dropped her pestle, with which she was grinding pepper, folded her arms across her breast, and sighed. Poor child! The next day, the men returned with a pot of wine. They were all fully dressed as if they were going to a big clan meeting or to pay a visit to a neighboring village. They passed their cloths under the right armpit and hung their goatskin bags and sheathed machetes over their left shoulders. Okonkwo got ready quickly, and the party set out with Ikemefuna carrying the pot of wine. A deathly silence descended on Okonkwo's compound. Even the very little children seemed to know. Throughout that day, Nooye sat in his mother's hut, and tears stood in his eyes. At the beginning of their journey, the men of Umofia talked and laughed about the locusts, about their women, and about some effeminate men who had refused to come with them. But as they drew near to the outskirts of Umofia, silence fell upon them too. The sun rose slowly to the center of the sky, and the dry, sandy footway began to throw up the heat that lay buried in it. Some birds chirruped in the forests around. The men trod dry leaves on the sand. All else was silent. Then from the distance came the faint beating of the akwe. It rose and faded with the wind, a peaceful dance from a distant clan. It is Ozo dance, the men said among themselves, but no one was sure where it was coming from. Some said Ezemili, others Abame or Unata. They argued for a while and fell into silence again, and the elusive dance rose and fell with the wind. 
somewhere a man was taking one of the titles of his clan with music and dancing and a great feast. The footway had now become a narrow line in the heart of the forest. The short trees and sparse undergrowth which surrounded the men's village began to give way to giant trees and climbers which perhaps had stood from the beginning of things, untouched by the axe and the bush fire. The sun breaking through their leaves and branches threw a pattern of light and shade on the sandy footway. Ike Mefuna heard a whisper close behind him and turned round sharply. The man who had whispered now called out aloud, urging the others to hurry up. We still have a long way to go, he said. Then he and another man went before Ike Mefuna and set a faster pace. Thus the men of Umofia pursued their way, armed with sheathed machetes, and Ikemefuna, carrying a pot of palm wine on his head, walked in their midst. Although he had felt uneasy at first, he was not afraid now. Okonkwo walked behind him. He could hardly imagine that Okonkwo was not his real father. He had never been fond of his real father, and at the end of three years, he had become very distant indeed. But his mother and his three-year-old sister. Of course, she would not be three now, but six. Would he recognize her now? She must have grown quite big. How his mother would weep for joy and thank Okonkwo for having looked after him so well and for bringing him back. She would want to hear everything that had happened to him in all these years. Could he remember them all? He would tell her about Nwoye and his mother and about the locust. Then quite suddenly, a thought came upon him. His mother might be dead. He tried in vain to force the thought out of his mind. Then he tried to settle the matter the way he used to settle such matters when he was a little boy. He still remembered the song. Eze, Elina, Elina, Sala. Eze, Iliqua, Ya. Iquaba, Aqua, Olegholi. Ebe, Donda, Nechi, Eze. Ebe, Izuzu. Nete egwu sala. He sang it in his mind and walked to its beat. If the song ended on his right foot, his mother was alive. If it ended on his left, she was dead. No, not dead, but ill. It ended on the right. She was alive and well. He sang the song again, and it ended on the left. But the second time did not count. The first voice gets to Chikwu, or God's house. That was a favorite saying of children. Ikemefuna felt like a child once more. It must be the thought of going home to his mother. One of the men behind him cleared his throat. Ikemefuna looked back, and the man growled at him to go on and not stand looking back. The way he said it sent cold fear down Ikemefuna's back. His hands trembled vaguely on the black pot he carried. Why had Okonkwo withdrawn to the rear? Ikemefuna felt his legs melting under him, and he was afraid to look back. As the man who had cleared his throat drew up and raised his machete, Okonkwo looked away. He heard the blow. The pot fell and broke in the sand. He heard Ikemefuna cry, My father, they have killed me! As he ran towards him, dazed with fear, Okonkwo drew his machete and cut him down. He was afraid of being thought weak. As soon as his father walked in that night, Nwoye knew that Ikemefuna had been killed and something seemed to give way inside him, like the snapping of a tightened bow. He did not cry. 
he just hung limp. He had had the same kind of feeling not long ago during the last harvest season. Every child loved the harvest season. Those who were big enough to carry even a few yams in a tiny basket went with grown-ups to the farm. And if they could not help in digging up the yams, they could gather firewood together for roasting the ones that would be eaten there on the farm. This roasted yam soaked in red palm oil and eaten in the open farm was sweeter than any meal at home. It was after such a day at the farm during the last harvest that Nwoye had felt for the first time a snapping inside him like the one he now felt. They were returning home with baskets of yam from a distant farm across the stream when they heard the voice of an infant crying in the thick forest. A sudden hush had fallen on the women who had been talking and they had quickened their steps. Nwoye had heard that twins were put in earthenware pots and thrown away in the forest, but he had never yet come across them. A vague chill had descended on him, and his head had seemed to swell like a solitary walker at night who passes an evil spirit on the way. Then something had given way inside him. It descended on him again, this feeling when his father walked in that night after killing Ikemefuna. Mefuna.